get started. Um, yeah, shall we get underway, shall we? Um, yeah. So first and foremost, uh, thanks everybody for joining us for what is the first session, uh, first live session of the Festival of Road Safety. Um, before I hand over to Nick to, to get underway, um, just a couple of quick things to run through. Um, as build, this is a discussion session, so uh, we'd like to encourage as much audience participation as possible. And there's two ways in which you can do this. Um, the first, uh, as Rob Wiltshire has, has already worked out, is through the chat function. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session and feeding the best questions in. Uh, the second option is to use the raise your hand function um, when prompted to do so by Nick. Uh, if, if we select your question, you will then be asked to unmute yourself uh, and deliver your question. Um, as mentioned, this is our first workshop, so please bear with us uh, with the technicalities. Um, anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, I will mute myself and hand over to Nick to get the session underway. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for that. And thanks everyone for, uh, for joining today. It's really great to have 56 people at the moment participating. We had 100 re registrations for the session, so we were fully sold out. So I guess there's more people joining us over the next few minutes. So, uh, but it's really good to, to, to have everyone on board and to be doing this today. It's my first chairing of a session for a year, would you believe? So, uh, and I'm a little nervous. I've got to say, it's the first time I've chaired an online session. So, uh, I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not looking forward to not being able to see the audience. That for me is always a massive gauging point, is looking at the audience and seeing what their reaction is to how things are going. But uh, we can't do that today, more's the pity, but, uh, but I'm looking forward to it anyway. So can I first of all introduce our three expert panelists today um, for this session? The first one is Emily Cherry. Emily, as I'm sure you all know, is Executive Director of the Bikeability Trust. We've also got Duncan Dollimore, who's Head of Campaigns for Cycling UK and Sonia Hurt, who's Road Safety Manager for Derbyshire County Council, and also one of Road Safety GB's experts with regard to cycling. So you're all very welcome. Thank you very much for making the time available and looking forward to the next hour or so. Now, as Ed has already said, we, I have got some preset questions that we're going to put to the, uh, to, to, to the panel, but uh, I'm keen to make this as interactive as possible. So I am gonna come quite quickly, actually, during the session to to uh, the audience to uh, ask if you want to put any questions on the hoof, as it were, to the panel. So, uh, so it's not going to be uh, by any stretch of the imagination talking heads. It's going to be very much interactive. So, uh, so without any more ado, I'm going to turn first of all to Emily, if I may, and ask her a question about something she said in the Bikeability Autumn newsletter. You said there, Emily, that your priority is to ensure that as many children as possible can continue to access training in the current climate, of course. How realistic is that at the moment? And how do you think that you and others can achieve that aim? Yeah, so um, thank you for, for the opportunity. Um, lovely to virtually see so many people joining in and, and uh, really looking forward to this discussion. So um, yes, you're gonna start with the question about COVID, aren't you? So how realistic particularly is it is in this COVID period? It's never the subject that any of us want to talk about currently. Um, so we're committed at the Trust and so are DFT, um, absolutely uh, ministers and Chrissy and Harris who I was speaking to only a few days ago, are really committed to making sure that as many children can get access to bikeability and cycle training in this period. Obviously, we are in a very, very, very difficult circumstance. Um, we're about to enter, as you all know, into the second national lockdown from Thursday. Um, what we've done in this period is we've done a number of things to make sure that bikeability can still happen. The first thing that we've done is really looked at all of our delivery guidance and um, uh, scanned across all of the government guidance and made sure that bikeability can be as COVID secure, to use the government language, as we possibly can do. So we know that our instructors can go in, can deliver in school, and they can do that in a COVID secure way um, and that's that's still happening we we didn't have as much delivery happening in the summer period um, but autumn period has been looking very busy in fact some providers are telling me that they are busier than ever in this period because schools are really desperate for children to get access to this life skill um, and to be able to buy capability but we're also quite realistic about that are the sessions smaller than they, they would be otherwise or not? In terms of uh, so we did originally in the summer when the first lockdown happened, we actually changed the numbers because of the rules around bubbles and that was initially in school. Now, of course, what reverted to in the September period is that whole school year groups were considered as bubbles. So we could go back to the original bikeability levels um, and the original numbers that were in there. So, yes, we could do small groups um, in the summer, but now we're back up to delivering as normal. Um, and we don't anticipate unless government guidance changes. Oh 
in the next 48 hours or so um, that, that that will change for us so we can and should be delivering in schools but the other thing that we've also done in this period to make sure that um, we can still use the grant money wisely sensibly um, is we piloted a new version of bikeability so called bikeability family and that's for one family household group to get individual bespoke training so parents and children being able to be trained together um, on uh, to, so that parents can get access to the skills and children can get access to the skills as well so we are still committed to doing as much as possible to get cycle training out in this period and we're about to release some more grant money to enable um, that, that family cycle training to happen more often so we think we can probably train about 2,500 family groups over the next few months just to be clear you did say that the training is going to continue in the current lockdown period like ability it, we can't say that for sure at the moment because we're still working through all the implications of the prime minister's announcement and we're working with department for education and department for transport um if dfe guidance uh, which has not yet been issued that's being issued imminently over the next um, few hours if that doesn't change then bikeability can still happen but clearly if public health england mandate that um uh, bikeability cannot happen then, then we would have to look at that but at the moment as it currently stands as i'm sat here there is no changes that i know Know of to bikeability but i can't say that's not going to change in the future yeah that's the current position though that's very interesting to know thanks very much for that sonia or duncan do you want to come in on this question of training in the current climate any any observations or thoughts or advice or or for, for road safety teams or anything like that i think just um following on from what emily said nick uh yes it is a very challenging environment uh for all providers and uh, but I think what's really shone through is the commitment to continue to deliver bikeability and as Emily touched on uh, also how that's still being welcomed within schools because it's outdoor it's popular uh, people want to buy into it so yes there are challenges funding is definitely an ongoing challenge in terms of uncertainty as we know and uh, obviously just having that rubber stamp that we are okay to continue to deliver bikeability uh, but the way that bikeability is being delivered in terms of obviously stringent covid secure smaller numbers uh, yes different ways of working and just trying to implement uh, as much training as possible in a, in a more restrained environment okay thanks duncan do you want to add anything just very briefly, just to pick up on one thing that Emily said, and just to remind everyone that learning to ride a bike for a child should be a life skill. And it's really, really important that we don't have a cohort of children that lose the opportunity to have that training as we have this horrendous period of COVID. Lots of children would have been expecting to have that in the, in the summer term from sort of May, June of last year, in year six. Some of them will probably have missed out that opportunity it's important they don't miss out a second time because if they miss out now it may be something that doesn't come back to them yeah that's a good point before we move on to the next subject is anyone in the audience got anything they want to say any 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 road safety officers out there involved in training who want to contribute anything at this point to, to give any advice to to colleagues about offering training in this uh, current climate for some reason i can't see that yeah andrew tucker hey do you want to pick that one up Hi Nick, yeah we have a question, uh, question on the chat from Andrew Tucker um, which says we're experiencing quite a high level of cancellations on bikeability courses uh, this week. Courses cancelled by schools, sorry just scroll down a bit, uh, courses cancelled by schools across the Northwest, Midlands and London. We and our LA partners are sending comms to try and mitigate this. How can the bikeability trust help in this? Um, so we do know that's the case uh, and lots of courses are being cancelled um, we've already sent out communications about uh, what you can do uh, to, to make sure that the grants can still be paid for cancelled courses so where it's a local lockdown situation or where it's a whole school year group bubble we will still potentially pay the grant if instructors are not eligible for any of the government support schemes because we're desperately wanting to make sure that we keep as many of our instructors um, and our providers um, afloat in this really difficult period so that's really important 
to us. What we are also doing, and, and I alluded to it earlier, that we're working with the Department for Education. Um, I'm, I'm really keen to work with the department and keep offering to work with the department so that we can produce them both video resources, guides, we've shared our guidance with them, um, and we are urging the department to sort of get behind bikeability so that they can send out information to head teachers direct to share and show that they have a confidence that what we're delivering um, meets with government guidance. So they've reviewed our guidance. We've uh, we put out a statement already to say that the Department for Education has reviewed our guidance, and we would encourage head teachers um, to look at the guidance. And that's what we've done, and that's what in our communications. But we're you know we're doing everything we can to keep trying to promote that bikeability can at the moment, as we're currently sitting, happen in a COVID secure way. Okay, that's great. Um, I think I think we're going to move on now to to, to another topic, if that's okay. Um, I want to talk for a minute or two about the temporary cycle infrastructure that's being put in across the country, predominantly, I guess, in in urban areas. Do you, does do the panelists all welcome this 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 infrastructure, or or is it doing more harm than good, as it was suggested by the Alliance of British Drivers recently, who were questioning or challenging whether it was making best use of the road space that's available. Just wondered, Duncan, have you got a view on that? I do. It won't surprise you to hear that, that I do welcome it, but I think the best place to start with this question is just to have a dose of reality. I think some of the critics of the temporary infrastructure are forgetting that the normal rules haven't applied this summer. Um, people responsible for making decisions in local authorities have had to deal with matters in an, an unprecedented circumstances and time scale. So never before have people in charge of or responsible for transport planning had to factor in something called social distancing, which none of us knew about in February. And so there has been a learning on the job experience. And in May, local authorities were instructed by the government to do things very quickly and money was made available for them to do that. And lots of them didn't have shovel ready schemes available to them. And so they made decisions quickly and they implemented things quickly. And it would be naive to suggest that every scheme that went in was perfect and that there weren't mistakes. And so lessons have been learned, I think, in terms of um, what works, what doesn't work, how you can perhaps do some engagement and consultation in an emergency situation without doing a full consultation. Unfortunately, the second round of funding is about to be announced by the government. And that involves schemes which aren't really meant to be temporary. They're meant to be uh, trials of where local authorities want to put permanent infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, and that should be the next phase of rollout. And hopefully there'll be some lessons learned from the first, the first phase. But I do think those that are criticizing that which local authorities have done very quickly need to have some perspective about the circumstances and timescales within which they were directed to act. Yeah, you see what the ABD said was that road closures, school streets and new cycle lanes are creating severe congestion, long traffic delays and severe frustration across the country. Although well intended, the experiment has failed. Now you're saying that isn't the case. Well, the congestion point is, is quite frankly nonsense. Um, congestion was costing the UK economy £6.9 billion a year last year. Uh, when you listen to some of these things about cycle lanes causing congestion, you could be mistaken for thinking that we never had it before March of this year. We did. Uh, the reality is that um, congestion cycle lanes are the answer to congestion. We, there's no plan B really in relation to the situation we've got. We've got 56% of people having returned to work, but car levels up till this current last few days were at 100% of car use that we had in March. So we've got a huge chunk of people who used to get public transport who are now driving. Yeah. That's what's causing congestion. Now, it, it is the case that if you have a poorly placed cycle lane, that might not help the overall flow of traffic, but you actually move more people in a cycle lane than you move people in the main traffic highway. So the suggestion that it's cycle lanes that are solely responsible for congestion isn't born out of any evidence that exists. No. no. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? Yeah, I'd like to comment if that's okay, Nick. Uh, I think it's important, uh, just following on from what Duncan said, to acknowledge all the work that's been actually done by local authorities. Um, there was a very, very tight time scale uh, to produce bids, uh, get that information actually into the DFT, and then to actually produce something on the ground. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Some schemes have been successful, some schemes possibly not as successful, but it's always good to, to trial something within an environment which is obviously quite, uh, quite unique. Um, there's also been the element also of managing the uh, public and political expectation and uh, some of the temporary schemes have been welcomed, some of them haven't. It's a very, very big learning curve. And just on the back of the comment in relation to congestion, something that has come out consistently has been speed. Uh, has been a big issue which has been raised uh, nationally. Uh, and obviously there's quite a few more vulnerable road users that have been put into the mix during the lockdown period. So I think that the temporary uh, tranche one was an opportunity to trial some schemes which we possibly wouldn't have had for both cycling and walking. And uh, yeah, we are now um, waiting for the uh, outcome of tranche two and possibly some of the tranche one schemes that will lead from uh, temporary into permanency. Uh, that was part of the criteria from the DFT. Thanks, Sonia. Is there anything on the chat line, Ed, you want to pick up, bring in at this point? Uh, we have a couple of comments on the chat again. Uh, one from Stuart Mottishaw, which says, uh, in my experience, cyclists have been more critical of the pop-up cycle lanes than the drivers have. Um, a second from Nick Hughes says, uh, it is the usual polarised arguing. Uh, some schemes were good and some were bad. In my experience, the bad ones have been taken out. Um, he goes on to say, uh, these facilities need community buy-in to be successful longer term. Yeah. I think the feeling I'm getting is that not 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 surprisingly, really, in this in this forum here, we 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 don't have too much tr sympathy with the ABD's position on this, and uh, we think that the the government and the local authorities are acting with the best of intentions under very difficult circumstances and are broadly doing a good job. So, I think if you're happy, we'll move on from this point. I can't see the uh, the, the hand up uh, uh, icon on my screen. Can you, are there any are there any are there any is there anyone Ed? Uh, volunteering to ask a question by putting their hand up? Uh, I'm scrolling through and there are no hands raised at the moment. Great, okay, that's fine, good. Let's, let's talk now, if we can, for a moment or two about, the, about the, the government's plans to make England a great walking and cycling nation. Uh, there's, this is a plan that was, that was re revealed in the summer, obviously, July, £2 billion of, of funding behind it. And uh, what I'd like to ask now to the panellists is, Broadly speaking, what do they like about the plan and what do they think is missing from it? Emily, should we start with you? Oh, well, I think my, my uh, response is probably going to be the obvious one. I mean, we absolutely literally jump for joy um, seeing in there that uh, cycle training for both children and for adults. And I think that's the I'm adding that deliberate emphasis there in terms of kind of adults as well. And that really strong commitment made in the plan was made there. Um, Cycle training for adults is something that Bikeability is wanting to do more. We've already started doing that with some of the grant uh, money that we had across the summer. We know from uh, what we hear from parents, what we hear from providers, what we hear from instructors on a day-to-day -day basis that quite often adults can be a very, very big barrier to children taking up cycling long-term. So having that commitment to also train and support adults was something that we really strongly support at the Trust. Um, I, you know, other parts of the plan, I mean, we, we do strongly support the infrastructure investment, um, very much so when we did uh, the work for Bikeability to school week with Sustrans um, in September, we surveyed parents and you know, majority of them, I think it was four and five parents were telling us that they don't allow their children to cycle to school because they don't enjoy the cycle routes and they don't feel it's safe and it doesn't have the right level of infrastructure and support. So we absolutely strongly support the cycle infrastructure plan. I think it's a bold vision. Um, I think we're uh, worried about the CSR now not being comprehensive spending review, sorry, being a three year program for revenue spending because that's where bikeability and cycle training funding um, now obviously sits so we need to urge and push number 10 and for government to make sure that that investment comes out quickly so that we can really level up and make that promise and get to every child if we don't get a multi-year settlement it's going to be very hard to ramp up the program yeah Is, are you concerned about funding going forward i mean clearly you must be i guess with with the bigger picture of what the government's investing at the moment to try and tackle covid and what the implications might be for things like Bikeability and other schemes like that. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've got great ambition at the Trust. Um, we want to be able to say we've just launched a new five-year vision. Um, so our vision up to 2025 is that we want to train five million children in the next five years um, through cycle training programmes. Um, but we need to evolve bikeability. We need to do new ways of doing it, including virtual reality programmes to encourage more sort of um, key stage three, key stage four teenage children to be able to do it. That all takes investment. Um, and we want to absolutely make sure that our instructors and our providers are getting the right level of grant per head so that this is a viable business for them as we scale that up and seek to reach every child. I guess the only thing that I felt was sort of missing from from the plan a little bit and, and hasn't been um, and hasn't been currently funded to the level that I would like it to be funded to is to make sure that we remove any barriers for children to take part in cycle training you know access to cycles for those children in deprivation for children in care for vulnerable groups for underrepresented groups there isn't currently government funding to be able to tackle some of those big barriers as well as cycle storage in schools which can be a big barrier to us even getting cycle training in there so th those Bits were not not sort of um, prominent enough um, within the plan for me. Okay, can I ask Duncan and Sonia in turn actually also to? I, I think we're, 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 I'm going to accept that broadly we support the government plan. I think that's a reasonable position to start from. So what I'm really interested in is is nuances really within it. So areas where you think perhaps they they haven't gone quite quite far enough, or or they could have gone further, or they've got something wrong in the plan. So. So Don Duncan, can we ask you first if you've got anything along that lines that you'd like to share with us? Yes, it, it, the, the concerns for me are the, the lack of a delivery plan and the funding. So if I start with the positive, it is a fantastic ambition or vision document. Lots to be very, very pleased about. Yeah. I could list the things, but I think we've established the point that the ambition and the, the idea and the goal is fantastic. And so as a cycling campaigner, I was really pleased to read it. But vision documents uh, aren't the same as delivery uh, and although there's been some mention of money we, we don't actually have a clear funding plan for delivery of infrastructure so there's a bit of it that's a long shopping list of things that are required without a clear delivery plan about how they're going to be funded and delivered we've had money released for this year for the emergency act of travel fund and the the next tranche of it but local authorities really still don't know what's coming next year we have a spending review at the end of, 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 of November and the, one of the biggest problems that local authorities have had on anything to do with active travel for years is stop start funding and the uncertainty as yeah. to when it's going to be made available, if it's going to be a competitive tender process and that prevents them making long term plans. Um, one of the criticisms of active travel and of the emergency infrastructure and of schemes generally is when local authorities put in place a bit of infrastructure that doesn't connect to a network. So we have an absence of network planning. Well, it, it, for Sonia's local authority, they can only network plan if they're able to look at what the funding streams are going to be for X years to come. They can't network plan on the basis of what they've got available for the next six months. And that's the bit that's unclear. And it's that delivery plan and the long-term funding streams that need to be confirmed. Um, and it's a bit worrying that we may not have that with the spending review. Sure, yeah. Sonia, anything to add? Yeah, uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, just to kind of follow on from the fantastic aspiration, I'm, I'm a very keen cyclist. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a really exciting vision for the future. Uh, but in terms of things and improvement, yes, I think the funding side is going to be obviously key, as it always is but the amount of funding, because if we really want to make the changes to the infrastructure, and I, mean, and I mean make significant changes to the infrastructure and consistent changes so that when you drive from one county into another county, you're in that same similar type of environment to encourage more walking and cycling, you are looking at a very significant amount of money. And also the um, realistic timescales for local authorities to be able to do that. Uh, and the, the kind of um, knock on effect in relation to the behavioural change side of things. So fantastic to throw all this money at infrastructure, but then what we've got to do is lock in the benefits to ensure that people want to use it, feel safe to use it, understand how to use it and respect the road space, which is for everyone. Yeah, that's great. Anyone in the audience want to contribute at this stage? 
Ed, is there anything on the chat line? I keep calling it a chat line. Sounds a bit, is that the right phrase for it? I don't know, but. Uh... Um, yeah, we have another comment. Um, I think this one takes it back a little bit, but it, it goes on, it's from Kate Wiley, and it goes on to say, um, as a bikeability provider, I can see that investment will be needed to train new instructors. Cost can be prohibitive for some potential instructors as work well, cannot be guaranteed. Uh, we work in an area, Kirklees, um, where children also need access to bikes to take part in bikeability. Um, we take bikes into schools, but the cost of the van, bikes, etc., is very high. Emily, do you want to say anything about that? Um, so, Kate, good to hear from you. Thank you. And um, as a provider, I, I hope things are, are OK for you. You know, it's really difficult out there. And just thank you for everything you're doing to make sure that bikeability continues to happen. So I always want to say that first. Um, I, I agree with you completely. So um, in terms of the ambition bid, if you like, that we've kind of put into Department for, Ed, uh, Department for Transport uh, to support bikeability for the future. And we're calling it a bikeability for all programme. We're starting lots of stakeholder engagement um, over the next six weeks. If you haven't yet booked onto a session, get onto the trust website and book yourself on so you can hear more about the vision but we are building in all of those things so bursaries for instructor training um, CPD for instructor training which we will do with the likes of um, Duncan and Cycling UK so that we can really open this out as a career and a path um, that is much more attractive uh, as well as that and we're also looking at the grant funding model so how do we make sure that we get the best value out of that grant that can deliver as much training to, to children as possible and support the wider sort of bikeability industry in there as well um, so really 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 keen um, to get your thoughts um, and get involved uh, in our bikeability for all program because we really want to engage all of our providers and instructors in that program great thanks it's just one thing i'd just like to get your view on if i may in in in, in the vision and that's this business of gps being encouraged to prescribe cycling as part of a treatment plan for for someone i mean obviously they've launched this, this right now that's going to be way down a, a, a gp's list of priorities i guess but in the longer term do you think that there's merit in that idea panelists emily do you want to go first as you're on um and so it, i think certainly if we were to reflect on what we've done in the summer um with the adult training course so we trained about two thousand adults um across the summer and quite a few of those adults were telling us and this is anecdote not not evidence but we're telling us it was for health benefits um so it wasn't necessarily leisure riding it wasn't necessarily commuting it was something that they'd recognized in their own life that could be a healthy lifestyle for them to be able to adopt um, and that's why they had come to take cycle training so that they could really feel confident about taking it up so i think it's something we put, we would support yeah sonia or dan could you want to comment on that Yes, please, on this one, because uh, uh, we have a particular relevant experience here. We were funded at Cycle UK by West Yorkshire Combined Authority to run a Cycle for Health programme. Um, and that was effectively uh, a referral based programme where we were, refer were receiving referrals from GPs and other agencies and a specific targeted scheme for people with some of the worst health outcomes. Uh, it, we thought it was going to be largely physical health issues, but actually quite often the physical issues were a function of people's um, mental health and well-being issues. And the aim of the 12-week intervention package was to try and get people involved in a community activity on a bike, some basic training and skills, almost in a playground type capacity, and then on to the new infrastructure on the Leeds Bradford sub highway, and effectively try and get them at a stage after 12 weeks where they'd be confident to continue some of those activities within a community club type sex setting. Uh, they, the results of that have been phenomenal, albeit on a very small localised scale. And there have been a number of similar little projects around the country, which I think has been the catalyst for the government thinking this is a way forward, to think about public health in the same conversation as transport. And so we're massively in support of this as an idea. Yeah, great. Sonia, anything to add? Uh, just really that, you know, great in terms of the mental health agenda as well. And if it's appropriate for that person, um, then, yeah, fully supportive of that. Excellent. Good. Thank you all very much for that. I want to move on now to my next point, if that's okay. Unless there's anyone, anything burning on the, anyone going to put their hand up and ask a question in the audience? No. Okay, I'll get you before the end of the session. Someone's going to do it, I reckon. Kate Wiley looks good for me. She looks as if she, she'll be confident enough to put her hand up in a minute. Um, right, okay. Um, I, I want to go on to, to, to talk about 
cycle training for adults if we can we've touched on this already and and particularly the, the question of how we persuade more adults to take part in it that's the bit that i'm interested in now i think we all agree universally that, that cycle training for adults is a good idea but it's how do you get people to, to to participate that's that's the question i'd like you all now to to, to just just give me your view on if you will should we start with sonia on this one oh <laughs> Yeah, hey, you it, weren't ready for that, Sonia. But, no, that's okay. Uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? This because uh, I kind of came into cycling, really came into cycling when I was probably in my uh, mid forties, uh, I would say, and um, never had any really. Last week, then, Sonia. Last week, thanks, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and and never had any kind of appropriate type of cycle training. But if I look at this sort of from a statistical point of view, and possibly not the way to encourage, but there may be maybe a means of doing this. We do tend to use this, or some some authorities use it in education. That um, statistically, uh, sort of the the sort of middle aged cyclist, perhaps the born again cyclist, uh, for example, tends to feature very highly on the stats. Uh, and that tends to be predominantly male, um, but they are a very, very difficult area to reach. Having been involved in trying to um, help to prompt education from various angles within to, within to that group, uh, I think it's the, the acceptance of the fact of um, actually taking training sort of later later in life when perhaps there's a feeling that those skills have been developed yeah. so i think the the family element if that's appropriate is a really good way to come at this because it's an inclusive angle and it's not just potentially singling out a, a particular age group but it's an inclusive um activity which might encourage more uptake i can see how that would work yes but but you know encouraging mature men to, to, to participate in a cycle course seems to me even more challenging than asking mature men to participate in a motorcycle training course but uh, yes. Duncan and Emily either one of you really either of you want to chip in here I'm happy to Duncan if they <laughs> well, Emily is a is, is more the expert in this than me but I think there is something about trying to see the capacity to involve workplaces in this mm -hmm they have a captive audience it's in the it's in the interests of employers to have a healthy healthy workforce um we know all the statistics suggest that those that have some form of exercise to and from work are more productive they have less sick days that are taken each year and so there is a there is an incentive there for for workplace delivered courses you obviously yeah. need to get employers on board we have a uh, we're the franchisee for the delivery of the cycling friendly accreditation scheme in the uk that doesn't include training but it includes things like ensuring there's bike parking provision and we work with employers around that and i think the issue of adult bikeability training is adult cycle training generally is something which there's a, there's a conversation to be had about whether it's possible in some places to bring that into the workspace yeah, so I would I would echo what Duncan said about workplaces, and we absolutely we absolutely support that in terms of kind of employer offers is a means to be able to do that. Um, I think London has a lot of learning here. London trains about seventeen thousand um, adults year on year with cycle training, and, and largely it is commuters going into the workplace. Um, and they've also launched uh, in this pandemic period a new cycle skills um, online training version for adults. So four different online e-learning modules giving you some of the uh, four core functions that, um, that national standard cycling um, and that's been really really well taken up so I think there's definitely some models there in London to learn from. I think what we've learned um, that's really important for adult training is it has to be bespoke, it has to be based around that adult learner's needs if they're wanting to do a leisure ride, if they're wanting to, if it's a grandparent wanting to be able to, to learn to ride with their grandchildren it's got to be bespoke based on the learner's needs um, and in the times that adults can do it so you can't just put on a course on a Tuesday afternoon and expect adults to turn up it's um, I, I think we're sort of recommending it should be much more small groups one-to-one -one, and based on the learners needs to have that flexibility um, but it's something that we strongly support um, and we're, we're constantly working with TFL at the moment um, on the next step of their adult learning courses. Now I know that Michael Corden's in the audience today from Cycle Confident he's a trainer in London now Michael are you able to are you, are you able to unmute Michael Ed because I'd like to ask him to come in on this point if he would and just to give us his experience on, on, on it. Is that possible? 
so, so funny enough, we just had a comment uh, in the chat from Michael Corden. Um, yeah, I was hoping he might come on live. Is he there? Is he happy to do that? I can't see the, 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 the hand up facility. Is it available? Yeah. We have a hand up now as well, um, but just, just on Michael, he is, according to his comment, he's currently on a train uh, to Bristol and therefore cannot say it out loud, oh. but I can read his comment out for you, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, if you would. Yeah, read his comment out. Uh, at Cycle Confident, we have trained many thousands of people in London through the TfL Cycle Skills programme, um, 9,000 last year. The word training is definitely off-putting. When the Cycle Training programme was rebranded to Cycle Skills, numbers rose significantly. In addition, 70% of participants are women. Uh, he said there, I would chip in, but I'm on a train to Bristol, I see. Yeah, no, so, okay, that's fine. Yeah, okay, Michael, thanks for that. That's interesting. Uh, so, we do have that. We have a hand up from, from Kate Wiley, so I can, I can, well, then, I'm now allowed. Uh, hello, Kate. Hello, Kate. Hi, can, can you hear me now? We can, yes. Yeah. Um, hi, well, you did invite me to speak. So, I did, yes. <laughs> Um, we've been running some adult cycle training in Kirklees um, over the past few weeks, which we tried to get sorted out for summer, but couldn't quite do it because we couldn't get a venue. Um, I would agree that most of the people who wanted to do it were women. In fact, most of our Learn to Ride people were Asian women. I would say 80%, yeah. a good 80-90%. Um, the reason it's been so successful is that most of these people do not have a bike yet. And they don't know what sort of bike to buy so we've had full courses we, we ran our last one on sunday obviously we've cancelled the rest of them now um but the reason it's been successful is that we were able to go to a venue in huddersfield which has got a range of bikes that we can use because without those we wouldn't have got these people to do learn to ride sessions um yeah. and it, it's crucial because they don't know what bike to buy until they've actually ridden a bike yeah. and we, we have two instructors available so that we can differentiate between complete learn to ride people to those who rode 30, 40 years ago and want to get back to riding. So those cycle hubs where people can get to, and most of the people were either walking or coming on the bus to get to us, those cycle hubs are sort of crucial to doing adult learn to ride. You hear me? Has it gone off again? Have we lost Nick? We may well have lost Nick. Um, <laughs> lost the technology. Um, does anybody else have any, any, any response to that? I'll just stand in for a second. Uh, does anybody else have a, have, have a response to Kate's comment? Ah, I think Nick's back actually. Um, yeah, I just think it's really, really welcome to hear. I mean, we, we are hearing about um, so many more courses, particularly with BAME groups and women um, happening as well. So really, really encouraging to see that those, those will happen more. I, I do think we probably need some more sort of behaviour change campaigning as well um, alongside this to really encourage people to take up cycling um, and, and think about what some of the barriers to taking up cycle training might be. Um, I, I think that some of the brand and some of the wording, I, I don't disagree with Michael, cycle training does put people off. Cycle skills is another way to frame it but we do need some sort of behavior change campaigning work in this space as well welcome back Nick. thank you thanks ed yes sorry about that everyone the pains of living in the country i'm afraid but uh, there we go i'm back now but thanks kate i'm so glad you came on with those comments that was fascinating to hear i, I was going to also and i don't know whether we've done this one already but but uh, i wanted to talk about ethnic minority groups and and people who who who, who could be described as inequalities within cycling how do we encourage more participation amongst those groups um, and, um, and 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 anyone got any views on that I think Nick that um, we shouldn't be surprised that if we have infrastructure that sometimes looks as though it's only suitable for the brave to ride their bike around that we have a certain demographic of people riding bikes so if the cycle route to your workplace involves riding around gyratory roundabouts with no separated cycle lanes, you're going to get a certain type of person doing that. Sure. So key to actually um, enabling more people to cycle is the infrastructure. But there are demographics and ethnic groups and various people who require a nudge with their, to get them involved and make this look and feel like it's something for them. 
And to go back to Emily's previous comment, that's why the behavior change work to complement the infrastructure is so important. Um, wherever, as like in the UK, we have behavior change pro projects, well, wherever we're working with community cycling clubs, wherever we're delivering the Big Bike Revival project, it's abundantly clear the demographic of people cycling is different. It is less looking like my cohort of people riding. It becomes a more inclusive and a wider group of diverse people riding bikes. And that's why that behavior change work is so important. But it's, it's, it requires revenue funding and it requires sustained involvement. Uh, but it is, it, it's crucial to complement the infrastructure if you don't just want more of the same type of people riding bikes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to say anything? I think it's important that uh, in areas of deprivation, especially cost isn't prohibitive or cost, cost isn't prohibitive at all so that it can be an inclusive activity. Um, I know there's been more lean towards how that's looked at from funding through the government, um, but I think that's very important in terms of participation and consistency. So I think that the comment that I'd like to add is, as the trust and, and our commitment at the trust is, we also need to do better at our own diversity from the board to our staff team, to our instructors, to who are out there delivering day to day, to the ambassadors that represent the trust. We must and should have more diverse members across the whole of the trust to encourage all communities to take part. And that's something we're very, very, very committed to do. When it comes to things like a bursary for future instructors for training for grants, we'll look at how can we encourage um, and have sort of specific diversity targets to make sure that we are getting a better representation across our instructor workforce will be something that we'll be committed to to doing in this space. Uh, Ed, I see Michael's chipped in on this one as well, Michael Corden. Do you want to just read out his, his contribution to this, this debate? Um, yeah, we, we do have a comment from Michael. It says that to encourage BAME groups and those who are hard to reach, we need to work hyper-locally, encourage champions and activators to become instructors and ride leaders, put the skills into communities as opposed to interventions. Seems to make a lot of sense. Can't think anyone's going to disagree too much with that. Uh, we also have a raised hand. Um, okay, go on in. Uh, from Susan Douglas, who are now uh, allowed to talk. Uh, Hi, Susan. Ask to unmute. You need to unmute yourself. Or you're right, right, Ed's going to do it for you. Hi, Susan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, sorry, you skipped on to another question uh, before Ed noticed my hand there. So I wonder if I can just jump back one yeah, no onto problem. the uh, training, oh, not supposed to use training now, eh? uh, onto the uh, uh, workforce, I'll say training, workforce training. Um, I don't know if Emily can like, pick it up a little yeah. bit. So I, I work for the London Fire Brigade yeah. and um, I'm also a cadet instructor and one day I was at cadets and one of my cadets who was 16 uh, turned the corner into the fire station riding a bike with a bright uh, blue, I think it is, Deliveroo jacket on and a big box on his back. And I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I started working for Deliveroo. Mm -hmm. And he rode in and had no helmet on and uh, just on his I don't even think it was his bike. I think it was a bike he borrowed because he didn't have a bike. And, and he was delivering for Deliveroo uh, when he was out of school. Yeah. And I was, as I'm sure you'll agree, majorly shocked by this. Uh, so I tried to look into uh, the training that, that they may have or want to put forward or, or anything like that, or if I could get involved with uh, getting involved with uh, Deliveroo to try and uh, combat this with these these cyclists and had absolutely no response whatsoever uh, from Deliveroo in any way, shape or form um, that they were interested in looking after any of uh, the cyclists because um, in their words, they're not, they don't work for us, they work for themselves. Mm. Uh, so they didn't see them as employees and they didn't see a responsibility for them. And I still have, I've still tried to, to go forward with this and had no response whatsoever. So with the, you know, gig economy and also yeah. with lockdown, a lot more people are ordering uh, online and, you know, waiting for their takeaways with these little lads coming along on their bikes. I just wondered if you had any ideas or advice 
and how to one interact get involved or combat it or even if we should try and go forward and um make them responsible uh in in some way and i don't even know how but about six it's, questions there and so <laughs> it's really it's a really important topic area you've just brought up there so and uh, thanks for thanks for bringing it to to our to, to the discussion today and ask any of the panelists if they want to comment on this this business of not specifically delivery but this type of organization that's that's working as you said with gig economy employees anyone got anything to say nick just jumping in on this one this has been a conversation around various road safety circles and groups for a number of years uh, i suspect this isn't going to be a very satisfactory answer for no. susan but i think the reality is this is a bigger problem than a road safety problem it is a function of the gig economy yeah. The reality is that the gig economy, um, those involved in the gig economy are desperate not to do anything which might look like they're accepting contractual liability for people. And they fear that if they provide training or if they provide some requirement for people to have undertaken some course before they ride a bike or before they're driving to deliver, the more they do to make it a requirement, the more the lawyers will suggest that looks like a contract of employment and their whole business model is based around their not being a contract of employment. Um, I think that's a problem which is beyond the realms of probably the people on this panel to resolve. It's a problem for Parliament and it's a problem for legislation about the gig economy which extends beyond this conversation but which you can see very clearly from Susan's comments in relation to how it impacts on road safety. But it is one of those things which I think we have some limited ability to resolve. Anyone else want to add anything? I, I would just only echo exactly what, what Duncan said, um, although it's, it's very interesting that that organisation that you mentioned is now in partnership with a major children's charity promoting the fact that they've trained all of their um, drivers in safeguarding. Um, so that there is there is an argument that cycle training could also be done. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only yeah. thing to add to I'm that, to yeah, just really the... Um, depending on the organisation relating that to the occupational road risk and re reputational risk of the company um depending on the scale of the scale of the problem that might be another way of actually uh, coming at that yeah great and in the audience got anything more to add to that Ed, anything we on the a, yeah we have a comment nick from colin young um, i'm not sure where colin's from but he says in the early days of deliveroo we were asked to train a new recruit to bikeability level three standard by the company uh, we only had this happen once though uh, I've also just had a comment in from Hilary Wicks, which says Cycling UK have offered grants to now start doctor bikes in schools. I think this is a great start and would love this to be rolled out to more schools. Uh, and so yeah. and Colin has replied to say he's from Durham County Council. Yeah, OK, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So anyone want to say anything about this? Um, the, the, the grants being offered to start doctor bikes in schools. Oh, we're delighted. We're, we're really delighted. So absolutely delighted to work in partnership to get this out via um, our, our bike ability providers um, and to, to work with Dr. Bike. So uh, on Bike to School Week, we took uh, Chris Heaton Harris in to go and see in school in a uh, local constituency where he saw some level two training and then got to physically take part himself in a Dr. Bike session with children. Um, so to, to see the benefit of having cycle training and cycle maintenance all in the same part. So great initiative and really in the spirit of where we're heading to at the Trust, which which is much more to kind of collaborate and work um, to, to get the best support out there to children. Yeah, great. Well, a couple of quick fire questions, if I may, for all three of you panellists. These are almost yes, no, although there may be some more than yes or no to the second part of the question. Do you support and encourage the use of the Dutch reach? And do you think that helmets should be compulsory? There we go. Two very simple questions. The answers may be more, quite, not quite so simple, but... Uh, should we start with you, Sonia? Okay. Uh, yes, I do support the concept of the Dutch Reach. Start with you, Sonia. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. And yeah. helmets? Yes, we um, can, yes. Yes, okay. Yes, so yes, I do support the concept of the Dutch Reach. Helmets, uh, always a big topic of debate. Um, personally, I cycle, I wear a helmet because for me it feels like um, if I was sat in, like driving without a seatbelt on. Um, it's, it can be argued for and against. Should they be mandatory? Personally, 
I think I would like to see them become mandatory, but there is lots of evidence that says contrary to that, that that wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, so um, it's a very topical one. Also, there's also the link to how does that look in terms of reducing a serious head injury to a slight head injury, but that then relates to how accurate that level of reporting is at the scene. So a difficult one to look at from a consistent point of view. Emily? Dutch reach uh, and helmets. So absolutely support the Dutch reach. I think it's great. We're, we're supporting uh, supporting that absolutely. Um, on cycle helmets, uh, I think most people will be familiar with bikeability trust position, um, particularly in training. So we know that it can be a barrier to some children being able to take up cycle training that they don't have access to a cycle helmet. So whilst we recommend children to wear cycles, it would not prevent them from taking part in training. But we do recommend that children should be you know should be wearing helmets. Um, I'm aware that the road safety trust has just done some work in um, uh, sort of uh, safety ratings around uh, cycle helmets because I don't think that sort of exists across the, the UK currently and I think that's really helpful to have that out now that some safety ratings of actually uh, what helmets can and should protect you from would be out there for people in the industry to be able to choose from. And that's your favourite question Duncan so I've saved you to last. Just reach a we campaigned on that so it would be odd if we weren't supporting it but there's a really interesting point to put about road safety communications on the Dutch Reach. We had been talking about the dangers of people opening their car door without looking for years. We never got any media take up of it, we never got any publicity about it, and we struggled to get people interested in the issue. A quirky little thing like the Dutch Reach came along and enabled us to do some creative marketing and advertising and promotion of it, and all of a sudden people were talking about it, and we were all over the news. So whether or not you think the Dutch reach is the, the manoeuvre to use, what that actually come, what the conversation did was highlight the issue of looking before you open your car door, yeah. which everybody would agree is a good thing. And so it's one of those things where it's a good example of, uh, of making sure that you actually communicate your road safety messages in a way that people engage with. And for that, on that basis, it was a very successful campaign or initiative. On the issue of helmets, we don't support them being mandatory. Uh, we could debate for hours the merits of helmets, but the, the, the one thing which I think the evidence is clear about is that wherever there's been mandatory helmet laws or requirements anywhere around the world, it's led to a reduction in the number of people cycling. Whether people think that should be the case or not, that is the clear evidence. And that's been typically around about a 35% reduction in people cycling. Amongst certain demographics, it's much higher. So in Sydney, it was a 90% reduction in teenage girls cycling when they introduced compulsory helmets. And so what we would say is you have to factor in the public health disbenefits, i.e. the consequences of, of less active travel, if you're thinking about this. And on that basis, we wouldn't support it being a compulsory requirement for people to wear a helmet. Thank you, Duncan. Ed, is there, any, is there anyone with their hand up at the moment? Uh, there's no hands up, Nick, but we have a couple of comments um, about the Dutch reach and a few other subjects. Yeah, go on then. Um, so I'll, I'll find the first one from Ian Watson, uh, who says um, it's because Dutch reach sounds like a euphemism. Uh, I guess that's why he's suggesting it's become popular. <laughs> uh, and a second one again from Kate Wiley. Um, Dutch reach, agree, uh, but the cyclist is putting your safety into the hands of the driver. We teach a door and a bit more on bikeability. So cyclists ride past parked cars uh, with space just in case the door opens. Um, and I'll just forward the conversation now to, uh, we, have a, we have a question, a comment from uh, Simon Claddingbowl. Uh, he says, good afternoon. Uh, with the prospect of the pandemic dragging on well into next year and the future, um, and the future leading towards working from home, do you see cycling as a form of future health and mental uh, well-being? Um, I think this point has been touched on, but investing in cycling infrastructure may prove to be a cheap alternative in helping keeping the nation healthy? I think I think that's a very good point and I'm sure that we would probably all be in broad agreement. Anyone want to come back and specifically comment on that or are we just happy to nod our heads and say that we agree with what uh, Simon's suggesting there? One stat, <laughs> one stat that uh, is one of my favourites is that the health benefits out of cycling outweigh the risks by 20 to 1. Uh, we might touch upon this later but that's a, an issue for how we deal with road safety and around cycling and how we market it. And sometimes it, it can sound when you listen to some road safety 
uh, people speaking that it's inherently a dangerous activity and we need to factor in the benefits when we talk about any risks of people cycling. We did a survey a few years ago of uh, 12,000 people um, in relation to people who cycled and one of the surprising um, results we got was the level of people who said they found cycling helpful not just for their physical benefit but for their mental well-being 96 percent of people who responded said that that was a factor in relation to um uh, th their choices and that they found it beneficial for that and i think that's even more the case given where we are with covid and restrictions yeah right now we've got about five minutes left here so i'm going to ask one final question then we'll take anything that we can, that comes in on the chat line or if anyone wants to ask a question from the audience just before we wrap up so the final question is a catch-all question, really, a very simple question, probably with not such a simple answer. But it's, it's what, what, can, what else can or should road safety professionals, road safety teams around the country be doing to encourage more people to cycle in safety? In other words, what, what, what should the profession be doing to encourage more people to cycle and at the same time trying to make them safer in doing so? Sonia, do you want to pick up this one first? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a collective um, angle to come at this from really, Nick. I think education is really key um, and education uh, beyond school. So uh, we, we know that getting into secondary school is incredibly difficult. We then know that historically we've had a gap after secondary school in terms of retaining uh, those key skills. So creating a consistency in terms of the, the learning journey um also um just just training training people sort of moving forward and um working together collectively i think sort of the partnership element is is very important for the future and it's not reinventing the wheels we've got the four e's we've got the education the engineer and the enforcement and then the evaluation so that that we know um how effective the measures that we put in are actually um are working but the, the, the infrastructure is, is going to be very key going forward. And if we want to encourage more people to cycle and to cycle safe, safely, uh, we've got to have the appropriate infrastructure in place. And uh, speed, you know, we are, we are a, um, a nation that's, that's reliant on the car. So uh, there's, there's a lot of education around the speeding element, the shared space, and people mutually respecting uh, from all types of road user. So you're, 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 you're talking there about educating other road users rather than, than cyclists to be aware of cyclists and the vulnerable. I think it's, it's, a, it's a joined up journey, to be honest with you. Um, I think we've got to try and um, narrow the divides between different types of user group. Uh, it's not the cyclist, it's not the walker, it's not the car user. Uh, when we're in the road, it's the shared space and it's people respecting that shared space and giving people the appropriate space that they need in order to use it however they choose to use it and that then encourages a more healthier environment in terms of how we travel in it in the okay. future. Shared space that's the message from you and getting that message across. So Duncan? Um, three very quick things one I've just touched on previously but it's, it, it's not making sound cycling sound a dangerous activity. I think that's a communication and marketing exercise uh, it, it's something that we sometimes fail on uh, across organisations the second thing, I agree with everything Sonia said about education, but we know that education often works best when it dovetails with the prospect of some enforcement. So I think it's crucial for uh, those that are involved in the education element of that to work constructively with those that may be doing some enforcement. And we've seen some great examples of that, for example, by West Midlands Police Road Harm Reduction Team and some of their close pass enforcement. Uh, and the third element is just on the issue of education and awareness. I sometimes feel that as we've changed the way we educate and inform young people uh, in the classroom environment and the way we do education within the workplace, we've not always moved as progressively in the road safety field to look at how learning is done differently. Um, we sometimes, we still see some of those films that are based on let's do a shock and awe thing or show something horrific and lecture people not to do this or those are the consequences. I've got kids aged 20 and 22. They're not shocked by things on a video. Their experience of seeing things growing up is different to, to what we were exposed to when we were children and young people. So they have to be engaged as to why something's relevant. 
we have to factor in when we're looking at trying to educate or inform or make young people aware the channels they use. I was having a conversation this morning about road safety content on TikTok. Um, now that's probably a conversation that the vast majority of people around road safety haven't had. Uh, and we should be thinking about different channels and whether there are different means or ways to communicate some of these things. Just before I come to you, Emily, Sonia, do you want to comment on any of that? Um, not particularly. I think, I think the education is, is very important and I, I do agree with some of the things that, that Duncan has mentioned there. So not, not much more to add for me on that one, Nick. Okay, fine. Emily, just, to, just a question to you then, the, the silver bullet, what's the answer? We've got to start, I mean, we're, we're talking about it as a life skill. Let's stop talking about safety all the time and just focus on this being a life skill and something that gives you joy, freedom and independence. Um, and we've got to start speaking to children and young people, particularly in a way that excites and engage them in the mediums that they're happy with. So the use of VR, the use of TikTok, the use of um, whatever platforms are going to come up behind TikTok, because it's probably only about another 18 months before another one will be up, up in, in place. We've got to stay with this generation and speak to them in the way that they're comfortable and happy with and then finally the thing that I'm always going to keep pushing for is um, we need backability on the national curriculum so it needs to have protected curriculum time and there needs to be an expectation by the end of um, key stage two when children are leaving primary school that they will have had the opportunity to do bikeability and that's how we can get to every child. Thank you very much. I'm going to give the last word to the audience. Ed by you. Um, we have a couple of comments, a couple of comments in. Uh, one from Nick Hughes, who says, totally agree with Sonia, let's share the space fairly. Um, another comment from Michael Corden, uh, who brings up an interesting point. He says, here's a thought, um, encourage use of e-bikes. An e-bike is not cheating, it's just another form of transport and really important in rural communities. Good point. Um, uh, there's a couple other questions, but I think that's probably about all we've got time for, I think. Brilliant, great. Okay, well look, we started, we peaked at 73 participants at one point, I think I saw. We've ended up with 67. Now, I reckon that's pretty good, really. So I'd really like to, first of all, before I thank the panelists, thank the audience for sticking with us. It's not easy. You know, it's an hour. It's quite a long time online. And I'm very delighted to see that we've, we've retained as many people throughout. So I, I hope, I hope that means that you found it interesting and useful. And can I, on your behalf, then thank Sonia, Duncan and Emily for their contributions. I think it's been a really good session. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you all have as well. And I think uh, the plan now is to, we've been recording this and with everyone's permission, we're going to, to make it live. So those that weren't able to join us live on the day, they can watch it at a, at, a, at a later point. It'll either go live either this afternoon or more likely tomorrow, I think, by the time you've uploaded it, Ed. But uh, yeah. thank you everyone. I uh, hope everyone's found it useful. There's some very nice comments coming through now uh, from people saying very informative discussion. Thank you very much. So I think everyone's found it helpful and useful. So. Uh, so thank you all very much indeed for your time this afternoon and uh, look forward to participating in the festival again as it progresses. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.